Good morning. Thanks for taking the time to attend my talk. As uh, was said, I'm Lynn Langett, and I'm working as an independent cloud architect and developer. This talk is visualizing cloud systems, and this picture has significance to the talk, which I will explain near the end. So the purpose of this talk is for us to take some time to think about what is the importance and the re relevance and the significance of system pictures. Working as a cloud architect and a senior developer, I've been thinking about this challenge for a while. And most recently, I've been thinking about it through a rather different lens. And I wanted to share that work with you here. So to get us started thinking visually, uh, you know, the hottest thing, of course, is cloud. And the very sort of tip of the hottest thing is microservices and Lambda. So when we think about architectural pictures, probably, if you were to close your eyes, you'd think of something like this, because the most prevalent cloud vendor doesn't even need an explanation. This is, of course, Amazon. And this is a reference architecture from Amazon. So if we take a look at this picture, and we try to look at it and think about it visually, and then we compare it with another reference architecture from a major vendor, we can start thinking visually. So this is a similar type of architecture from a competing vendor. So when you look at these two reference architectures and you think about them visually, what do you observe? Do you observe that there are differences in color in one vendor and not the other? There are differences in shape in the representation of services. There are differences in the uh, way the services are grouped on the diagram. Now, if you were looking very closely, and I'm sure many of you noticed this, you would say, well, I also noticed this. So in this particular architecture, this is a blended type of modern architecture in that it's not all serverless. This is a representation of servers. And it's blended also with the data tier as it represents server-based uh, database service. And although you may or may not have caught that information visually, it's probably pretty clear now. Now, if we look at this diagram, you have to do much more work to notice the differences. Did you notice there's a CDN represented here? And there's a search service represented here. In case you're not familiar, this is Alibaba. Um, which features in our story in this talk. Because I'm independent, I get to have my opinion um, in whatever form uh, uh, for all the different vendors I work with. And uh, this has been a source of amusement, but also frustration. I'm showing reference architectures here from uh, Amazon and Alibaba. And one of the challenges as a cloud architect is what I call the lack of reference architecture that has been in the Google ecosystem. And hopefully, you will notice immediately, after I brought it to your attention, that um, this lack of attention to differences in color and shape um, is reflected in the icons, which also were not available until relatively recently. Um, as an architect, I actually drew architectures for Google-based solutions using Amazon icons for several years, which I thought was kind of absurd. So speaking of Amazon, um, as we're thinking about modern cloud architectures, there are more and more and more services. And in addition to being a working cloud architect, I'm also an educator. I design courses for specific verticals, like the financial sector or education sector or now the scientific research sector. However, I also have created a series of courses that have been broadly watched, actually by more than 4 million people on lynda.com and LinkedIn Learning. I have 30 courses. So I get a lot of feedback from students, particularly people who are coming new into the cloud. And the most common question that I get is, how do I start? What do I do? Which services do I focus on? So one of the visual aspects of working with cloud architecture I call is layer zero, which is actually using visual representations of the services. So when I talk about visual representations of modern architectures, it really depends on which vendor you're working with. Amazon has consistently provided the greatest level of visual detail. 
And as, at least in my story, I think we'll see, this has resulted in more success for customers. Now what you see depends on what your perspective is. I feel very fortunate to have followed the previous speaker. I don't know how many of you were in here for her talk, but she spoke about linguistics and linguistic bias. And in some ways my talk is really an extension of her talk. And it's extending to a different domain, the visual domain. So oftentimes, when I'm brought in to companies to talk about implementing cloud-native architectures and I'm working with the developer group, the thinking is this. This is a cloud-native architecture. I'm going to implement a bunch of lambdas. That's what it is, right? So one of the things that's great about coming to conferences and being a part of conferences is not only to speak at them, but also to attend other sessions. And a session I recommend from this conference to watch on video if you didn't happen to attend it is the session called How to Be a Great Architect. It was really a, a well-presented session. One of the uh, uh, situations that the speaker challenged was what was the value of diagramming in general, which is a valid assumption. So one of the practicalities over working with visualizing systems that I found is this concept of just enough architecture. So rather than having a, a cloud-native architecture that looks like this, all lambda, or something that is drawn, you know, in a super detailed way, I more think of something like this. Now, my background is more in the data side than in the programming side, so I tend to start with the data tier. So this is a representation of table as a service, or DynamoDB. And this is a representation of file as a service. So then you might build on that. But before you build on that, you, of course, secure it, of course, right? So you might use some sort of Amazon service to do that, so Cognito or certificates. And then, of course, you will have your lambdas. And uh, then you might use some higher level services on top of that. And in this case, this is IoT. And this, although you might say, well, this is like ridiculously simplistic. This is just like not even usable. This is, in fact, a version of a picture that I drew for an architecture that resulted in working product in 10 months in an enterprise uh, environment where a previous attempt, and I would argue part of the reason they failed, uh, had no sort of diagram or picture, was for four years and 10 people and completely failed. This ability to communicate visually is an aspect of us working on systems that I think bears our consideration. So one of the things I want to do in this talk is talk about our, our own bias, starting with myself. So um, when I challenged Google so many times on their lack of icons or their all blue icons, they would answer back, does it really matter? Like, does it, does it matter? Does it matter? Like, why shouldn't we work on that? We should work on, you know, like optimizing the code and providing the services more cheaply. I mean, this is like a peripheral thing. And, you know, I kind of said, well, maybe it doesn't. Now, in terms of the kinds of applications I work on, I work on web apps, I work on Edge IoT, but the examples that I'm going to use in the rest of this talk are around work that I've been doing in the past couple of years in huge scale data pipelines. So I, I work, like I said, in different verticals, FinTech and uh, education, um, but three years ago, my perspective changed in uh, what I work on and where I work. And so the beginning of the story was geographically. Kind of by chance, you can tell by my accent I'm American, um, I ended up working in Australia on a project that would come to really define really all of my work subsequently. And I, at that time, was uh, dating someone in Australia. And uh, when he went to buy a map, he thought this was an entirely reasonable map for some reason. I, I don't know why, but he just thought it, was, thought it was entirely reasonable. So my perspective was changed by location. But my perspective was changed, more importantly, by the type of uh, data pipeline I was working on. Now, I was living at that time in California. And uh, there's a biotech center in San Diego, California. So I had had some uh, clients that were doing some really interesting work with genomic sequencing and personalized medicine. And at that time, my then 17-year-old daughter had interest in becoming a bioinformatics researcher, and she had the good fortune to attend Stanford University as a summer student at 17 years old. And she took some courses related to the most modern research around immunotherapies. And she came home, and she said, Mom, it's really surprising 
these people are really not using the cloud for their pipelines. They're not, they're not using it at all, or very little. Um, and I said, really? And I said, this is so interesting, because the amount of data, it's just, you know, you'd have to really do this. I said, so it's Stanford. They're not really Stanford, actually? And so I started really looking into this. And then it became really personal, because uh, a person who I'd known for a really long time got breast cancer. And she was unable to get personalized treatment. And I always tear up on this point because it's a person really close to me. Now, the happy news is she did live, she survived, but she nearly died. And it was horrific. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, too many of us know this story. Someone close to us ha has had this, like, really almost inhumane chemotherapy. It's literally like pouring bleach inside yourself. I've come to learn a lot about this. And, you know, that combined with, Mom, these people don't use the cloud, well, that was enough for me. So, Google had a project for me to work on. It happened to be in Australia. And I was researching what was going on with bioinformatics in Australia. And I happened to come across this blog post on Amazon that said uh, there's this modern architecture using, um, you know, serverless and all this stuff on this research tool that's been created in Australia. It's called GT Scan Tool. It's a search engine for CRISPR editing. Great, fantastic. What's the first thing that I want as an architect? The picture. What does this thing look like? Well, it was easy to find. It was on the blog post. And my goodness, it looked just sort of like a very simple serverless architecture. And I thought, how did this happen? How do these people do this? Uh, I want to learn from these folks. So I uh, got a hold of them, and I was in Australia, and I said, how did you, team of four bioinformatics people, who only had you know, on-prem server-based solutions, how did you build this? And they said, well, we went to an AWS summit and we saw a reference architecture and we were able to understand what they were doing and we had the type of problem that they were talking about, so we thought we'd try it. And they did, and they built it. And I was astounded they were able to build it. And so was Amazon, actually. This is three years ago. And they said, well, we built it, it works okay, but we're having some problem. They said, you're a cloud architect, what can you do? Put you to work. And I said, okay. I said, well, in the world of cloud native, you know, uh, as you're well aware, you're not going to SSH into any server, so like, what are you doing with your logs? And they said, oh yeah, we don't really understand how that works, and uh, it's just like really frustrating. And it was kind of good timing, because I was able to say, um, in terms of their performance bottleneck, have you seen a new tool available from Amazon, which was just then released, X-Ray, which is a log aggregator. So the second aspect of visualization of success in the story is that in one day, we were able to, using an effective visualization tool, identify the lambda that was a performance problem, rewrite it, redeploy it, and achieve an 80% increase in speed. So those two things really got me thinking, wow, this visualization thing, this is like super important. Subsequently, the team in Australia, and it's a CSIRO, Commonwealth for Scientific and Industrial Research Organization, were able to build on the Alibaba cloud. Was it because of the reference architecture picture? I don't know. But it's interesting that they've built to date the GT scan tool only on AWS and Alibaba. And although they attempted, they have not had success on the Google Cloud. Is that solely due to the lack of attention to visualization? Probably not. Is it a factor? Maybe. So we had some success, and I was motivated. So they said, OK, we have a really difficult challenge now. We have another uh, situation that we want to make cloud native and take advantage of all this and you know, be able to accelerate our research. And it needs to be reproducible. So one of the things that I have found in working with bioinformatics really fascinating, read one study, that of the research that was examined in that study, 75% of it, and this was for uh, research for immunotherapies for cancer, was not usable. And it was not usable because the environments of the computation were not reproducible. And I thought, huh, I'm a teacher. This is a problem I can work on. 
So they threw me a really difficult challenge, these people in Australia. They had written this library, and I won't go too deep into this because it's not extremely relevant to the visual part, but it's a really gnarly, difficult machine learning, custom implementation of random forests for an analysis of DNA to find variants. And the, the idea is that you slice it both horizontally and vertically so that you can use uh, the Spark memory executors to process it more quickly, blah, 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 blah. Whatever. Okay, it's domain specific. It worked for them, kind of like the GT scan, with one little challenge. It runs on a Spark cluster, which they only had on-prem, and they had no DevOps people. And they had to get in line to wait to use it. And it took 500 hours. Now, coming out of what I would argue were the less important domains, like ad tech in California, where I was optimizing pipelines for displaying ad results in milliseconds, I thought this is, well, I'm just going to say it, this is bullshit. I mean, this is not acceptable. This is not acceptable. So there's something that we're going to have to do here. How are we going to go from no knowledge of cloud other than the one GT scan thing they did really quickly to taking something as difficult as this and taking advantage of cloud technologies? Well, again, this architect in the other talk made a point that I felt very validated. He said, it's very common in architecture to go directly to optimization and to skip over, do users actually want it? So I felt very validated, because the very first thing I did, looking at this problem, I said, let's make a hello world to see how many people want to use this, because I thought, before we spend all this effort optimizing it, let's make sure. So what the team did is they created a fun example um, to check whether or not you are a hipster based on your genomic traits, and this is actually based on real genomic traits, so they have kind of a fun sense of humor. And we created a Jupyter Notebook toy example using um, uh, Databricks. Interestingly, though, we refactored visually our example based on our talks around the world. Uh, the first time we gave this talk, you may not even think of this bias. We didn't, and we're both women. It's kind of embarrassing. We had a person come up to us and say, how come you don't have a hipster girl? And so we refactored the diagram to have both men and women. And then this is the version, I think, from India, because if you notice, you have a little dot right there. So um, we actually uh, would uh, change the diagram so that it would be more culturally relevant wherever we spoke on this all over the world. And this we did before we did any sort of picture of the system. So what is your picture of Hello World would be sort of the actionable thing to think about here. So this is a technical crowd. I have to have some sort of technical credibility. Were we able to do this? Were we able to get it from 500 hours down? Yes, we were. 10 minutes. We succeeded. Mostly. Mostly. So I was determined. This was cancer research. I'm an architect. I'm an educator. I'm going to draw a picture. I'm going to get these people there. I'm going to have reproducible research. We're going to make this so everybody can use this library in the world. I probably drew this Lucid chart eight times. I drew it and drew it and put it on Twitter. And I asked people, is this consumable? Is this understandable? How can I get people who want to know how to do this but don't have any DevOps to be able to build this on an Amazon EMR cluster? Because we'll start with lift and shift. And we had some success. We did. Now, this isn't the most beautiful diagram in the world, but we had some success. So then we got ambitious. My team, we said, oh, Spark now works with Kubernetes. We can use containers, and we can make a data lake, and we can make this serverless. And we did it. And that's how we got to 10 minutes. And we felt fantastic. We were so proud of ourselves, and I wrote this all up on Medium, and I open sourced the code, and I was so happy. And then I decided that we would expand this center, and we would make a big pipeline, and we would solve all the world's problems. Oh, we're so great, aren't we? Hmm. They didn't use it. They didn't use it. They were very polite and nice when I flew to Australia, and they were able to run it when I was sitting there. But they did not use this version. They used this version. And then I was really, really thinking, what? What? How come this Terraform code, how come? That's easy, right? That's, I got a diagram. It's easy. They should be able to use it. OK, honestly, I could barely use it. OK? 
It's very complicated. I was basically doing that to them. I was giving them increasingly complex diagrams and saying, here, simple, you should be able to do it. Horrible. So the bias that we, of course, have, we all know, is towards adding complexity. The new dimension I want you to think about is how that's reflected in how we visually represent our information. Now, I've been thinking about this for a really, really long time. I've been working in tech for many, many years. I had a whole other career in data warehousing. I've written three books on OLAP cubes. It's old technology. And I used to teach about OLAP cubes. This is a multidimensional cube. I used to teach this language called multidimensional expressions. The point is, I've had a lot of experience with complexity via dimensionality because of this work I did for many years in working with n-dimensional data structures. So I started to think about how what I knew there could be applied to this problem of systems and picturing systems. So of course I'm in Germany, so die Grenzen meiner Sprache bedeuten die Grenzen meiner Welt. As the previous speaker, I too am educated in linguistics and not computer science. So I tend to think of problems in my work from a linguistics lens. So I was thinking about how is my language limited because I have tried every way I can think of to communicate how to implement this 10-minute solution to these people in Australia who are very talented and very motivated. So it must be a failing on my part in my communication. So what is missing in the way I'm communicating? So I recently moved across the country, moved out of California back to the middle of the United States after 20 years, and I've uh, bought all new furniture. And so, you know, sort of what you're immersed in is what you think about. So this is like how, how, in, how can I communicate in a more universal way? As I'm putting together the IKEA furniture, I'm like, is it like a furniture diagram? Is that what we need to have? Um, I have this problem where I need to do graph translation for another client. And like, is this a graph translation problem? How do I need to communicate this effectively? And I'm thinking in terms of dialects because of my linguistic background. So what is the dialect for systems? What is the vernacular? And then I went on vacation, went on holiday. And I thought, that's it. Visual dialect. I need to take it up a level. I always think in terms of words because I'm trained as a linguist. So as the previous speaker, who was fantastic, by the way, and you should watch her talk if you were, didn't attend it, you know, you work at the level of words and you work at the level of code. The thing I want you to start to think about is a higher level, a visual level. This is on vacation. This is in Sedona, Arizona. And when you see something that's so beautiful like this, that you don't even want to go anywhere, you just want to absorb the beauty, even if, like me, you don't consider yourself a visual person, you start to think, there's more to this visual layer than I've been thinking about. So I'm a voracious reader, and I think it's sort of fun to read academic papers on vacation. Weirdo, I know. So I have all these linked, and so I've been reading papers like uh, The Dimensionality of Visual Space, a visual and a framework for dimensionality reduction based on data exploration, blah, 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 blah trying to learn from different domains. You may want to learn, too, so I linked them all here. So, of course, I'm working now with bioinformatics. So, uh, at one of my clients across the street, there was this art exhibit, and I thought this was so fascinating, because I find in working with uh, clients with more and more data, there's more interesting sort of visual representations. These are representations, it is an art exhibit. It was in Boston, Massachusetts of uh, disease conditions. And I thought, this is just so fascinating. I've never really thought about visualizing data sort of as art. I just didn't think of it. So it's really challenging to try to work with cancer researchers because they have deep knowledge about their domain. So I'm always trying to learn more quickly. And I'm reading all these papers with all these terms. And what I do sometimes is I'll just watch videos. So let me show you a bit of this video, because it gave me an insight. Hopefully the sound will work too. It's kind of fun.
pocket watch is a long time. It goes on for eight minutes. Um, the insight that I had was, aren't our systems more like living systems than like furniture? And how can we show them as being living systems? Can we take metaphors from biology rather than from architecture, building architecture? So I was thinking about this quite a lot. And again, as you would know from what I talked about, I had the background in data warehousing and data visualization. So I've had the pleasure to go to some of David McCandless's actual seminars. And first I will note that I'm the only person who is not a visual designer, usually there. I'm the only person who's a programmer, which is interesting. Um, and David's perspective of data visualization is all about the melding, melding the visual and the conceptual, I think is uh, useful in the domain that we're trying to think about. So uh, I feel I have learned quite a lot from studying his work to understand what makes good information design. And I think that when we think of architecture and visual representations of our systems, the metaphors that we're using need to evolve. So I've spent some time, fortunately, uh, in, in a past uh, career, uh, well, actually this career was a long time ago, in Zambia. And uh, one thing that was really fascinating to me is uh, there was this uh, concept of uh, singing in Zambia. And I said, oh, you know, I, I can't really sing. I'm not talented. I'm a bad singer. And uh, they said, no, if you can walk, you can dance. If you can talk, you can sing. There was no concept that singing was a specialized skill. And applied to what we're thinking about here, I always sort of thought of myself as, I'm not really an artist, I'm not really very visual, I can't draw, I use words, those are my tools. And as I was really thinking about this problem, I was thinking, maybe I can draw. What would I have to do to draw? So, you know, uh, we're geometrical, that's where we have to start. Um, and so, I actually, as an exercise, um, had challenged myself of drawing, which at first I felt a little bit silly because I, I really don't have any sort of experience or practice, but if we're going to work in a visual domain, then we need to develop our visual skills. And we all start from the point that we're at, and this idea of bad drawing or no talent in drawing maybe is not a valid assumption when we're trying to visualize systems. So uh, it's been an interesting process to challenge myself visually and to exercise, to practice, like we practice coding, to practice drawing, to practice representing ideas visually. So is sketching best? Is this the best thing that we have? Should we be making some sort of tool that we can take our sketching and translate it into executable architecture? Uh, should we uh, pull from different domains like uh, dance when we're representing movement? Again, I really started exploring outside of what we're doing. Again, there's so many examples in biology, how to show system change over time, and all these are linked so you can see the underlying references. Really started just exploring visually and trying to think about how this could be applicable to the things we're making. And then how to show beauty. One of the things that I find, because I had this background in data, uh, data and data visualization, is there's this emphasis towards beauty that I don't see very often in software architecture, and I, I wonder why not. Why can't software architecture be beautiful? Um, and then negative architecture. Uh, there's a great quote from Michael Feathers, who probably a lot of you know, I think he's spoken here. Um, he says in a, a blog post linked uh, around negative architecture, the guarantees form a negative architecture, a set of things you know can't happen in various pieces of your system. And this is a, a wall panel from the Japanese Museum in uh, Los Angeles where there's a lot of Asian art. And uh, I've always found it fascinating in Asian art, as I've observed it, that the negative space is as important as the, as the positive space. And uh, representing that visually, I think, is something that is, you know, we haven't really even considered. Like, what's not on the diagram, I guess, is, is to make it practical. So, 
the bias that I really feel I was suffering from trying to visualize systems before I had this insight on vacation and being motivated by really wanting to solve these challenges in the bioinformatics community was I wasn't looking outward. I wasn't looking beyond, I kept looking at like, what's the best architecture diagramming tool? What's the best software drawing tool? Who are the best architects? I really think as an industry, we need to look beyond what we're doing now in terms of visualizing software architecture so that we can envision and picture and portray and build the architectures of the future. So one of the people from whom I'm taking quite a lot of inspiration, but I didn't have the insight to apply it to architecture until relatively recently, is this uh, man, Brett Victor, who used to work at Apple. Um, and he has a series of really brilliant uh, uh, videos and information on his website. And again, I'll just show you a little bit of this um, dynamic systems. Again, I could watch this all day long, but the insight that I had was, what if we applied this to architecture? How, what would this look like? Because more and more, we're working with cell-based, lambda-based, function-based architectures and cloud-native architectures, so smaller and smaller pieces. How would this look? All right, I'm a practical person. So even though I was kind of out in the art domain and out in the you know, data domain, I have, to, I have to get things working for people. So uh, this is actually from uh, the Broad Institute. This is a sequencing uh, flow cell. I got to go and see what it looked like. It was really, really inspiring. So one of the techniques that um, I have been applying is visual dimensionality reduction. Uh, in addition to my work as a production architect, as I said, I'm an educator. So uh, I had a client I was working with here, Technologies, and I was uh, building a set of reference architectures and uh, publishing on their integration with uh, Amazon uh, services. And one of the things that we were working on in this series was, it was an introductory series, appropriately styled visual architectures. So to go from the way out there, the Breck Victor, back to the very, very practical, there's much, much research in um, visual uh, information representation that people can only uh, process normally three to five uh, dimensions or aspects. So the simplification of architecture for the different audience, so this is for the developer audience, for example, is a technique that you could immediately imply to any of the architectures that you draw. So drawing them for the different audiences. So coming back to our story of bioinformatics, um, I clearly wasn't following my own advice here when I was making this architecture um, for the solution that took minutes. Um, and so maybe that was one of the reasons that they, uh, they weren't able to implement it or weren't comfortable implementing it. So what did happen subsequently? Did, was there you know, a continuation of that story and is there a visual aspect to it? Well, kind of embarrassingly, I need to follow my own advice. So this is the next thing that they built. And if you notice, it has three core visual aspects. So uh, the team in Australia took the work based on the cluster and they made it available in the Amazon uh, marketplace so that more researchers could benefit from their algorithm and in fact have had success. So they built what was needed, which is important, but germane to my topic, they pictured it in a way that was more consumable and understandable. So I need to take my own advice sometimes. But I was, you know, determined. I was like, okay, that's a solved problem. Now we want to build the pipeline, you know, architecture. You want to build the end-to-end -end thing, right? How do we get there? Well, because of the success that we had, I got introduced to some uh, people that were also doing research at the Broad Institute in Boston. And they're a really interesting group. They're the Broad Institute at, at um, uh, Harvard and MIT, so they're associated. And they're a nonprofit research group, but they... Uh, run some of the largest workloads on the public cloud uh, that are being run in, in any cloud because of the amount of data uh, used in genomic sequencing. So I got introduced at a Google conference to the lead architect from the Broad, and I was talking to him about the work that I had been doing with the Australians and saying I, that I had been kind of studying what the Broad was doing, and I was trying to figure out, uh, based on the pipelines the Broad was building, like how I could help take the Australian algorithm and visualize that so that it could be put into a pipeline. 
Well, it's really kind of interesting because uh, the Broad, in fact, has uh, worked uh, with Google um, on Google Cloud as a starting reference point, although they intend to make it available on all public clouds, to build uh, similar to the pipeline I had envisioned. It's called Terra. It's a higher level abstraction for uh, performing genomic data analysis uh, through different phases of the life cycle. And it was really kind of fascinating because, again, it was uh, based on uh, files, so really kind of a similar approach to what I had envisioned, but of course they're a team of 50 to 100 people, so the implementation was you know, much further along than what I was doing. So I thought, okay, I'm a practical person. Can I just take the algorithm that they're using in Australia and can I make this work on this pipeline? So now here's a question for you, see if you've been paying attention. The optimizer in us would want to do what? We'd want to take it and we'd want to run it at scale, right? But do you remember back, if you think carefully, what was the first thing we did before we optimized the algorithm? We did a visual representation with the cute little icon people to see if, if uh, you know, this algorithm, algorithm was something people would want. We made a Jupyter notebook, so we did that. So we tried to get the Jupyter Notebook, a reference example, working up on the platform. And we did. And it was a very, very important success because it enabled collaboration of Australian cancer researchers with uh, researchers who were using the Broad platform. So one of the assumptions that uh, we need to think about when we're visualizing our systems is at what level are we visualizing? In our case, it was quite important to visualize the hello world. We got more collaboration. So this is Dr. Dennis Bauer, who leads the work in Australia. And she says, um, our first notebook on the Terra platform showcases our machine learning software variant Spark, which uses Apache Spark and utilizes Terra's capacity, capability of custom environment configurations. We're uh, you know, excited to give our algorithm to the world, basically. And it took us two days and uh, people are able to run it for five bucks. So uh, what role does visualization play in this? Well, I would argue the fact that we, in visualizing and creating a hello world, we enabled the possibility of this scenario, which then took the work that they had done in Australia and is making it accessible to a greater number of people. So we often think in terms of visualization, in terms of scalability and understanding scalability, but I think of it in terms of accessibility, in terms of understandability, because when they had their GitHub repo with their really well-written algorithm, very few people were looking at it. Now that it is a sample on the Broads platform, they've had collaborations with people all across <coughs> Europe and in India and other parts of the world. Also, they were able to replicate the success they had with the serverless model with several other important tools. Um, and uh, Dr. Bauer's team has tripled in size. Um, so it's been just really an amazing success because of the appropriate visualization of these tools throughout. So to abstract this, the lessons that we learned, into things that you can actually go and do, because I like to give you something practical, give you five points. First, visualize your entire system. So often I see just the code. Um, and there is importance to that, but the configuration and the data. Use visual grammars. Account for bias. Okay, and I'm gonna demonstrate that. Oh, I can't take this off, okay. I really thought whether I should wear this or not because it's not black and Berlin loves black. You know what I'm talking about. I would not dress this way if I were presenting in South America. There is visual bias all around us, in our architecture diagrams as well. Reduce dimensionality. Show three to five aspects max. That is such an important thing for all of us, myself included. We like complexity. We like many dimensions. We can hold all these things in our head, can we? I don't think so. It's over and over and over been validated through visual studies that three to five is what people are comfortable with. Show the system state over time. Remember the dancer. Verify the reproducibility of the pictured objects. So that's the practical. Of course, we want to go beyond that. So because uh, of time, I, will, I have a whole entire section beyond this with a number of uh, people I've been collaborating with. 
people like Stackery IO, and, uh, which is based in the US, Thundra, which is based in Turkey. I have like eight slides of interesting visualization companies. So if you are interested in this domain, I will immediately make this link available after my talk. Go to the next section and pull down all those companies. One of my goals in doing these talks around the world is to inspire us all not only to think and to use visualization tools, but we're creators to collaborate and to create visualization tools that impact our industry. So I told you I would explain the significance of this picture um, at the end, and we are coming now to the end, so I will. So I'm continually trying to educate myself into the complex world of bioinformatics because it's fascinating and I need to have domain knowledge to work as an architect. So I was reading On the Way to Boston, a, a wonderful um, book, which is very recommended, called The Gene Machine from Venki Ramakrishnan. Uh, and he and a number of collaborators, both on his team and around the world, were awarded recently the Nobel Prize for their work in what? Their work in visualizing the ribosome. Because this visualization has enabled significant advances in treatment of many diseases. And I take this as a challenge to myself and hopefully all of you, that we should work in visualization of our systems so that our systems can be of a higher quality and be reproducible and usable across the world. So I think that's my time. Um, I'm Lynn Langett, and I hope you enjoyed my presentation. Thank you. Thank you.